True Picture of Immigration by Rebecca and Edward Berland, Chapter 5, Part 2 of 3, read by Carolise O'Brien. Insects are likewise numerous in America, and many of them of a larger size than any to be met with in England. There is a species of an ant found on the prairies, about half the size of a working bee. In traversing these grounds, particularly in summer, a person will, feel, will naturally feel inclined to rest himself occasionally, and may probably select for himself as a seat some little hillock, of which there are many. If he does, however, I will venture to assert he will be caught trespassing, and have to pay the smart, too. The butterflies in America are really splendid. Nothing can sur surpass them in design, depth of coloring, or in the delicacy with which their finely powdered wings are finished. I have sometimes observed, in very hot weather, when I happen to throw the door to the door a little greasy or soapy water, that the place thus moistened has been covered in a few minutes with butterflies of the richest and most brilliant dress. All the hues that the prism can elicit from the parent of colors have been there manifested, and that with such beautifully variegated combination as to render imitation utterly impracticable. The plan proposed in this narrative requires that mention be made only of such objects as would come under the notice of common observers, whereby a tolerably correct idea of the general state of the country may be obtained. I cannot, however, close these succinct observations on insects without noticing one of the flies about during the evenings in summer, and emits a light considerably brighter than that of the glowworm. When I first beheld it, I was not aware of its existence. It was one evening as husband and I were returning from the chapel, on a road that was principally through an uncultivated piece of woodland, as we were passing along, we observed in many places what we took to be sparks of fire dancing about most mysteriously. Our curiosity was excited not a little, but not knowing what to think, we dared not to approach them, for fear they were connected with something superhuman. Superstition certainly got hold of us, and we hastened home imagining some strange catastrophe about was about to occur. On reaching home, we found a neighbor waiting our arrival, to whom we related what we had witnessed. He smiled at our simplicity and told us they were light bugs, the name they are known by in Illinois. Fireflies, I believe, is a more general term, which gave us no small satisfaction, as we had been much disturbed to know what such a prodigy could imply. A few pages back, I attempted to describe the appearance of a winter night. I may now be allowed to make a few remarks on the peculiarities of a night in summer. As our situation in America is about 14 degrees further south than Yorkshire, I scarcely need say that the shortest summer night there is longer than the shortest in England by two or three hours. In this country, as the shades of twilight gradually usher in the more somber aspect of night, a delightful silence seems to repose on the bosom of nature. Hence Milton. Now came still evening on in twilight gray, etc. The reverse of this is nearer the truth in Illinois. It would be a burlesque on language for anyone during a night in summer to repeat Gray's admired line, All the air, a solemn stillness holds. I have already stated that owls are very numerous. They are also very noisy during the night. There is another bird, however, that outdoes them in this respect. It is about the size of a lark and has a loud voice, but only three notes, which it keeps continually repeating. It thus appears to keep crying, Whip away, or whip or will as some will have it. Hence, one or other of these terms is the name of the bird, which I believe is common through all North America. Unceasing as are the noises made by these nocturnal performers, there is a species of frog, known as the bullfrog, whose voice completely drowns the proceeding. It abounds in small creeks and ponds, of which there are many in some districts, though none near a farm. The moment this animal observes darkness approaching, it begins its tremendous croakings, which, as its name suggests, are more like a bellowing of a bull than the voice of a frog. Other animals might be mentioned with propriety as being peculiar to that country, as the mink, the opossum, and the raccoon. But as these are fully described in works on natural history, I forbear to enlarge, after I have related the following little incident. The footprint of that last-named animal is precisely like that which a little child, just able to walk, would make. There is the rounded heel, the hollow under the rise of the metatarsus, 
the toes, and the toenails, as exactly delineated as if it had been actually made with the foot of a child. This impression we observed before we knew anything about it. My husband's curiosity led him to trace it across a plowed field, as he really thought these prints had been made either by fairies or by the diminutive offspring of some concealed Indians, and was a long time before he could be persuaded that they were made by a quadruped. If the reader consults a volume on natural history, he will find this animal classed among the plantigranda, which, are, which will partly account for the above circumstance. The continuation of my narrative presents my partner recovered from his lameness, and busy thrashing our wheat in the open air, we had a small barn, but as the ground is almost as hard as the boarded floor at the season I am now speaking of, the corn is often thrashed in the open air. Many farmers thrash as soon as harvest is over, and without winnowing it, place it on a large heap and cover it with a thick coat of straw or another of earth, as farmers preserve potatoes in England. In this state it will keep very well for several months if required. As the cattle lie out all year round, the straw is of no use. They therefore burn it out of, of their way. The time had not yet arrived for us to practice this system of preserving corn. We wanted the full worth of our wheat, and that as soon as we could get. As we had no winnowing machine, we were obliged to winnow with the wind, which, though a troublesome method, is frequently practiced in Illinois, for the same reason as that which induced us to practice it on this occasion. The farmers in that country are much troubled with a weed that grows amongst the wheat, and of which is next to an impossibility to clear it. This was the first time we had anything to do with it. Its appearance when growing can scarcely be distinguished from wheat till it begins to ear. On this account it is called cheat, and not undeservedly, as it come, sometimes stands on the ground as abundant as the crop itself, and yet it is so valueless that even the poultry will not eat it. I have not seen anything in England that resembles it, more nearly than the weeds turned by Yorkshire farmers, Droke and Darnell. It is more like the former than the latter. Having thrashed and winnowed our wheat, in the manner above described, our next consideration was how we were to sell it. The produce of the three acres might be about eighty bushels, one-fourth of which was but imperfectly cleared of cheat, and was therefore unsaleable. We had only five sacks, which we had taken with us from England, but these even we did not require, as we subsequently learnt that the storekeepers were accustomed to furnish the settlers with bags for their corn. My husband took a specimen of wheat, which, as it had been sown too sparingly on the ground, was a fine sample. Mr. Varley offered half a dollar per bushel in money, or a few cents more in barter. We borrowed a wagon and a yoke of oxen of one of our neighbors, and carried to the store fifty bushels. The first thing we did was to settle our meal account. We next bought two pairs of shoes for self and husband, which by this time we wanted, as did the other articles of apparel, which we knew we could conveniently procure. The truth is, we had intended to have a little more clothing, but finding the prices so extravagant, we felt compelled to abandon that intention. For a yard of common printed calico, they asked half a dollar, or a bushel of wheat, and proportionate prices for other goods. We gave ten bushels of wheat for the shoes. I may just remark that the prices are considerably lower at the present time for all kinds of wearables than they were then. Our next purchase was a plow, bought in hopes that we should in some time have cattle to draw it, as we were tired of the hoeing system. We also bought two tin milk bowls. These and the plow cost about twenty bushels. We obtained further a few pounds of coffee and a little meal. The coffee cost us at the rate of a dollar for four pounds, and thus we laid out the greater part of our first crop of wheat. We had only reserved about twenty bushels for seed, besides a quantity imperfectly cleared of cheat, that was unfit either for sale or making bread. On balancing our account with Mr. Varley, we found we had to take about five dollars, which we received in paper money, specie being exceedingly scarce in Illinois. The interval between this time and the latter part of September was spent in further clearing the field, which we had before fenced somewhat more than half round. Our Indian corn was likely to be a failing crop, partly because it had been sown late, and partly for want of a plow, it had been but imperfectly cultivated. The autumnal rains had now begun to fall, 
and while other people's corn was ripe, a great part of ours was quite green and not likely to ripen before the frost. The little that was ready we cut and made into small stacks to be ready for seed the ensuing spring. October arrived. It was the season for sowing wheat, and we were little better prepared than we had been the preceding spring, for although we had a plow, we had no team. We could readily have hired one had we possessed the means. Five or six dollars were all the money we had, and we fully purposed to buy a pig or two with them, as we had been some weeks without any animal food except a few fowls, which we had bartered one of, the, of our china teacups. Our inability to raise a team and sow our wheat was a source of great anxiety. The hoeing system had answered so differently that we felt determined, if possible, to have it plowed. We knew a Mr. Knowles who plowed for hire. His house was about two miles from ours. My husband waited upon him and offered him one-fifth of the produce of eight acres for plowing and harrowing it. Reward, it is said, sweetens labor. Of this Mr. Knowles was conscious, but the idea of waiting for the reward till the ensuing harvest did not suit his genius. In short, he declined undertaking the work on any such terms. My husband was coming away almost in despair, but happened to look at his watch. Mr. Knowles accosted him in a tone of surprise that he should want anyone to work on credit while he possessed such a watch as that, telling him at the same time that he would plow and harrow the whole eight acres for it. I need scarcely say that he... They immediately agreed, as the watch had been bought in England a year or two before, for something less than a sovereign. We were thus relieved from our distressing anxiety and got the wheat sown as conveniently as we could possibly wish. This acquaintance with Mr. Knowles led to a further bargain between him and my husband for three young pigs just taken in from the range, for which we paid him the small sum of three dollars. They were scarcely fat enough to kill. We therefore gave them a little unsaleable wheat, which fed them very rapidly, so that in about a month's time they were became nice pork, weighing between nine and ten stones each. By this time our little stock of cattle required to be fed daily with Indian corn, part of which was uncut, and what is worse, some of it was unripe. That which had ripened was excellent fodder, the greater part of which we had cut. The little that remained in the field, being ripe, suffered no harm, whereas the last sown, not ripening before the frost came on, was much injured. The cattle would scarcely touch it. There is nothing particular in this. Water, it is well known, expands when it is frozen. Hence, all sorts of succulent plants of soft grain, having their vessels filled with a watery or juicy substance, must of necessity, when frozen, experience a disarrangement of their parts and have their vascular structure destroyed and consequently be liable to putrefaction and mold. In the various transactions I have had to enumerate, I have overlooked our potato crop, which was abundant, for although we had only planted half a rood, we had more than sufficient for our own use. The reader must be aware that no manure is used for anything that is grown. The land is as fat as nature requires, and tillage would, in its present state, rather injure it than otherwise. We had not sown any turnips this year. They are generally sown in July, immediately after the wheat crop is weeped, reaped, and often on the land on which it is grown. In all probability, we should have endeavored to sow some, had not my husband at this time been an invalid. The first Sunday in November was the anniversary of our landing in America, for we have now gone through the principal events of our first year's residence in that country. It was further distinguished as being the day on which the yearly feast is held at the little village where we had lived in England. This circumstance, trifling as it was, had a tendency to bring to our recollection in a most vivid manner, bygone associations and endearments, the value of which we only discovered when they were lost. Does the reader ask for an explanation? Let him consider for a while our condition, and if experience has taught him anything of the nature of those feelings which the love of one's country inspires, if he knows even what emotions are kindled by being removed from old and congenial attachments, he will perceive we had reasons for being sad on the occasion here referred to. The difficulties and privations we had already endured were not forgotten. The tattered appearance of our children's clothes, compared with what they had worn in England, made an impression on our minds, which even patient endurance could not resist. We were again on the eve of a hard winter, with less warm clothing to meet it, than we had on pre preceding winter by the wear of a twelve-month. This was one of the gloomy days in our history. The previous winter we had been prevented from attending religious worship on account of distance, 
we were now prevented from another cause, want of decent clothing. It was on this occasion that we perceived something more than poetry in the lines of Cowper. When I think of my own native land, in a moment I seem to be there, but alas, recollection at hand soon hurries me back to despair. There was, however, one cheering consideration. In all respects except clothing, we were better situated than we had been the foregone, the foregoing season. We had four acres more of wheat sown this year than the year before. We were now in possession of a plow. Our cattle had likewise increased in value. The cow had calved again, and the former calf had grown a fine-looking heifer. We therefore saw, after all, we were gaining ground. In accordance with my pretensions, I ought here to state that both I and husband had the ague very bad this month, happily not both at the same time. This complaint is too well known to require any description of it from me. It generally attacks new settlers at the end of their first summer, and even afterwards. At the fall of the leaf, it is by no means an uncommon complaint. As land becomes better cultivated and drained, this disease is less frequent. At the present time, notwithstanding its prevalence in autumn, it rarely proves fatal, except in instances where the constitution has manifested previous symptoms of decline and like a withered leaf, is ready to be blown down by the first fresh breeze that blows. The inhabitants have various specifics, real and imaginary. A weak infusion of common pot herbs, drunk hot, appears to be as efficacious as anything. When the patient ceases to shake, the ague is said to be broken, and unless fever ensue, as it sometimes happens, he is in short time quite well. After we had recovered... For a while, nothing occurred worthy of note. As in the winter previous, our chief employment consisted in attending to the cattle, preparing firewood and splitting rails. As before, our cattle remained out day and night, generally resorting during the latter to some sheltered situation. About Christmas, a person with whom we had had several interviews, named Mr. Vandervoozen, came to our house and wished us to buy two young steers and a milch cow. Footnote. Garrett Van Dusen, a resident of Pike County from 1821 to about 1850. He was a Kentuckian and an early commissioner of Pike County, a farmer and a stock trader. Nothing further is known concerning him or his family. Information supplied by Jess M. Thompson. End of footnote. We replied we could not purchase them for want of money. That reason, said he, shall not prevent you. I am going to keep a shop at St. Louis and shall often have to come up into the country. You may pay for them when it is convenient. Meanwhile, I shall expect interest for my money. At the time I am now speaking of, the usual interest paid for the loan of money was 25% per annum. It has since very properly declined to 12%. Having considered Mr. Vandervoozen's proposal, we felt inclined to accept it. The only impediment was in the failure of our Indian corn crop. By using the remainder of our unsaleable wheat, however, we presumed we should be able to winter them and felt assured that when spring arrived, they would be able to do well and greatly add to our advantages. The bargain was accordingly struck. My husband gave a promissory note for $30, with interest for the same at the same rate. We thus appeared to have increased our possessions and endeavored to brave our privations and the severity of the weather as well as we could. We were obliged, nevertheless, to economize our winter fodder, which was seen in the condition of our cattle. By degrees, they began to lose their flesh, a circumstance which made us doubly anxious for the return of spring. After much anxiety and unceasing diligence to preserve the health of our stock, the first of March arrived. In a fortnight, more we, ex more we expected there would be a plenty of fresh grass in the wilds, and we consequently looked forward to the time with pleasure, little anticipating how sudden a check to our satisfaction we were about to receive. On the 3rd of March, who should darken our door but Mr. Vanderusen, who had, as he expressed himself, called upon us for the money we owed him, that is to say, the thirty dollars we had agreed to give him for the steers and the sow, cow. Thunderstruck, at a request so unexpected and unreasonable, we expostulated to him with him on the terms of the agreement and explained our inability to answer his demands. Unfortunately, the note we had given him contained no intimation as the time our creditor had allowed to us. All our expostulations were unheeded. He withdrew, assuring us that he would immediately make use of the means of the law the law allowed him for obtaining his money. 
He was as good as his word. The following day, an esquire waited on us with a writ, which allowed us only a few days to prepare for its demands. An esquire is a legal officer, so named, whose duties embody both those of an attorney and policeman. Our own method of preventing the seizure of our property forthwith was either to replevin or pay the money. The idea of a lawsuit was neither adapted to our feelings nor circumstance, but how were we to raise the money? It was not so easy to raise money for cattle in Illinois as in England. Besides, ours were at that time looking ill and would consequently be undervalued. Should an execution be issued, our cattle would be driven to the appointed place for the sale of distrained goods and sold by auction, be the price what it could, would. In all probability, our whole stock thus sacrificed would be inadequate to the debt and expenses, which would place our very land in jeopardy. Now it was that we regretted having bought them on credit. Remorse, the most pungent, preyed on our heartstrings. The emaciated appearance of our cattle condemned our cupidity and upbraided us with all the contrivances to economize their provender. Meanwhile, the time approached for us to answer the demands of our creditor or submit to the process of the law. We had only one plan in view, which appeared at all likely to avert the threatened calamity. Our friend, Mr. B., had been privy to this speculation and had committed, commended our resolves. He had plenty of money in his possession, as he had made no heavy purchases since he obtained the remittance, and he was naturally thrifty. Two days before the time expired, my husband went to him and explained the conduct of Van der Rusen, requesting him either to buy some of our cattle or lend the money, for which ample interest should be paid. It is unpleasant to record this part of the conduct of our countrymen, Yet truth demands that I should say he refused to do either, alleging that he did not want any more cattle, nor did he like to lend his money. This refusal rendered our wretchedness complete. After my husband had heard his denial, his feelings were too heavily laden for him to urge any more. He came home melancholy enough, without having made any reply to his refusal. I shall never forget his return that evening. During his absence, my mind had been in a state of vacillation between hope and fear, and the moment I saw his countenance, hope entirely fled. What kind of a night we experienced! Those alone can conceive who has struggled earnestly and perseveringly with adversity without success. In vain did we extend our languid limbs on our homely couch. Spirits so disordered as ours were beyond the powers of sleep to lull into forgetfulness. The entire labors of a twelve-month were doomed to disappear. On other occasions, when my spirits had been depressed, I had laid my cause before the supreme ruler and found relief, but at this time I felt no disposition to look upward. We seemed despised and forsaken by all. In this state of mind we continued until morning, when a knock was heard at the door, to which my husband attended. Will the reader here believe my story? Shall I not rather be charged with fabrication? I can, however, tax no one with incredulity, inasmuch as I doubted my husband's assertion myself when, returning from the door, he told me that Mr. B. had brought us the money and gone away without saying he could not rest any longer without lending it. This account, I am aware, has too much an air of fiction, appears too nearly allied with the marvelous to obtain general credit. It might have been suppressed but as I am prompted to regard it as an instance of the overruling power of that being who maketh the wrath of man to praise him, I deem it to be my duty to record it as it occurred, and where it is now placed. The story is now easy to conclude. The following day, to the surprise of our creditor, we paid the money, and thereby put an end to the proceedings. We had no sooner settled this affair than we turned out our cattle into the woods, having previously marked them on the right ear. The sugar trees were now ready for tapping, and as we were anxious to pay Mr. B. as soon as we could, we resolved to make the best of them, especially as sugar is an article for which money can be easily obtained. We made incisions into a great many trees, and shortly had our large kettles boiling down the liquor. The greatest difficulty we experienced rose from an insufficiency of troughs to place at the bottom of the trees. We were obliged to cork up the holes of the greater part to prevent the liquor from wasting, while the rest alternatively alternately were running into the troughs. Notwithstanding this hindrance, we made at least 350 pounds of sugar, which enabled us to return our friend $15, half the sum we had borrowed. For the loan of the remainder, my husband agreed to work for him five days in the year till we could, could return it. 
that sugar this year did exceedingly well. For besides raising the above sum, we exchanged about 40 pounds of it for a sow and a litter of pigs, which we kept near home till they knew the premises, and afterwards allowed them to run at large till autumn. Thus the reader will perceive our circumstances kept improving. As we now had two milch cows, two steers almost ready for the yoke, one young heifer, a calf, a fine young mare, and a family of pigs just named. In agricultural pursuits, every season presents its peculiar task to the husbandman, and situated as we were, that task was not a small one. The season for sowing Indian corn had, one, had again re arrived, and again we were unprepared with a team. In the whole round of our agricultural labors, nothing so much perplexed us as, perplexed us as the sowing of our corn. We had only four acres this spring, as we had sown eight with wheat, and all of our other land was unbroken up, having no fixed plan in view and not knowing what means to adopt to get in the seed. We were agreeably surprised one morning to behold a person in the field busy plowing. This was Mr. Burns, the person named on a previous occasion, with whom we had formed an intimacy, or rather a friendship, which up to the time I am writing has only increased in degree and in value. In any country, such a person as he would be valuable as a friend, but in the thinly inhabited regions of the far west, his worth cannot be fully set forth. His kindness towards us as this, at this time is, however, a specimen. He and his wife had been at our house the previous week, and perceiving our coming difficulty, gave us the reason the gave us the above seasonable boon. We thus saw the whole of the twelve acres systematically sown. The wheat was a fine, thriving crop. We therefore began to feel ourselves more composed, and to use a good old English phrase, more at home. <laughs>